What's up everybody, Victor here, and it's time for yet another nation guide, this one being for Denmark and Lions of the North. Let's go ahead and begin. Let's go ahead and begin this guide by talking about the estates and privileges, because as Denmark, you can grant pretty much whatever you're comfortable with. There's nothing required or prohibited. That being said, there are five things that you should keep in mind that'll make your life just a little bit easier if you accommodate for them when you're picking privileges and playing Denmark. The first of which is liberty to desire from subject development. This is a penalty for having low crown land that makes your subjects more disloyal by increasing their liberty desire based on their development amount. The thing is, is personal unions do not get any liberty desire from their development amount, only normal vassals and marches. As you can see, Holstein, they get 10.5% based off of 21 development. Sweden and Norway, they don't have it at all. Which means Sweden and Norway do not care what your crown land is. So if you want to grant these privileges, go for it. It will not make them more disloyal to do so. So don't worry about that. That being said, two privileges do, and that is the nobility integration policy and strong duchies. These do impact your personal unions as well. Next thing I want to talk about is the religious diplomats. This is a privilege I grant that gives me plus 25 opinion with everybody that is also Catholic, and it makes it easier for me to get alliances with people like Poland, Burgundy, or Austria. You can still get these alliances in most games without this privilege. It just makes it faster and more reliable by having it. If you would rather not have this privilege and have something else, go for it. Again, it's not required. The next privilege like that is Monopoly on Livestock. This gives me enough money to build the Navy and Army units that I'm going to need to complete a mission, while at the same time giving me Mercantilism, which will boost the Provincial Trade Power by 2%, and you do have a mission fairly early on that you have to have 30% or more trade power in the Lubeck node, meaning you want to have more trade power here and that will help you do it. You can replace this with a simple loan or with the burger loan, just be aware that burger loans cost you a mercantilism, meaning you'll have to build even more light ships to get there. At the end of the day though, doesn't really matter which one you do. The last two things that I do need to cover though are both in your mission tree. One is right here. The Ratify the Kalmar Union mission requires you to have 3 stability. Because 3 stability already costs as much as it does, don't grant any of these privileges that reduce the advisor cost but increase stability cost, because obviously that's going to be a little painful. Just wait until you're done with that mission, and then you can grant them. It only takes you about 30 to 35 years to get through Ratify the Kalmar Union. The other mission that we need to talk about is down here, Revoke the Privileges. Revoke the Privileges requires you to have 61% crown land, and the reward you get is you will stop getting the Nobility Demands events. These are events that trigger on a five-year pull, so every five years you're going to get one, and they're pretty nasty, because they'll fire things like Pretender Rebels that you have to go deal with, or more Pretender Rebels, and it'll change the loyalty of your Nobility class, so you really don't have a choice, or it'll just give them Liberty Desire, or it'll make it so you end up losing tax income as well as vassal force limit contribution for the rest of the life of your ruler. None of which are good because obviously it leads to more liberty desire. So you don't want to have these events popping up, so you want to complete this. Obviously, by granting these privileges, it's going to make it longer to get to 61%. The thing is, this is not the only mission to get rid of those events. The other one is also ratify the Kalmar Union, this mission up here. You see, the reason why is because those events are tied to having the Kalmar election as a part of your government reform, which you start with. However, when you complete the Re Ratify the Kalmar Union event, you get an event that changes your government reform to something else that does not have the Kalmar election as part of it. Meaning, you stop having the events in about 30 to 35 years. So you have two choices. Either you can accept the fact it's going to take about 30 to 35 years, and just deal with the rebels as they pop up and then complete it this way and then stop having the events or in the alternative you will then not grant these privileges and use seizing land and conquering land to get up to 61 percent crown land get this mission done and then immediately grant the privileges and catch back up so it's up to you whether or not the three monarch point generation from the beginning is going to matter that much and how fast you can expand in my experience, it's better just to grant the privileges and get it this way because it's fairly easy to get it in about 30 years. With all of that being said, though, we're now done talking about the estates and privileges and can move on to other subjects.
Your military setup is pretty quick. You're simply going to take your army, you're going to hire six infantry to get yourself up to force limit and roll a general. It really doesn't matter if they're any good. If you really feel the need, you can roll your ruler as one because it's not going to matter that much. After you're done with your army, you're going to come in here and build three galleys, just find three open provinces somewhere and start construction. Simply by doing that, you'll be able to complete the Expand the Military mission, which will give you claims on all of the Livonian Order and Riga, and you're definitely going to want them. However, once that's done, your army and your navy are set up, it's simply time to delete both your fort in Lund and your fort in Jaland, because at the end of the day, no one's really going to get there. But with that, your military is now set up, and we can move on to diplomacy. Let's start this off by talking about your starting rivals. You see, every single game you're going to want to rival England at the very beginning. The reason why is because your first mission that you'll be completing is rival England. Go figure. And this mission requires you to either A, ally England, or B, rival and embargo England. And obviously, just embargoing them and rivaling them is going to be far quicker and easier than trying to ally them. This is especially true since the reward you get from the second mission is just claims on English territory. And every mission after that requires you to conquer English territory. So there's no reason to do all the effort required to get England as an ally, just to end up betraying them and attacking them. Just set them as a rival from the beginning. The other one you'll set at the beginning is Scotland. They're always available, and they're very easy to grow faster than and end up surpassing, giving you free power projection, or, in the alternative, getting Norway to fabricate a claim and declaring on them, and taking land directly from them and getting rid of them that way. So they're a good option as well. The last one is pretty much whoever rivals you because there's a lot of people that can start off rival to you that you cannot pick as a rival at the start of the game. The other ones that are available to you that you do not want to rival unless they rival you first are Burgundy, Poland, those two. Because if you rival them and they're not rival to you, you cannot pick them up as an alliance. And obviously you want Burgund Burgundy for the Burgundian succession and you want Poland because, well, they're really, really strong, and having them as an ally can be very useful. The only other one there is Lithuania, and you don't want to pick them as a rival unless Poland picks you as a rival. And the reason why is because if you rival Lithuania and Poland does not take the personal union over Lithuania, they usually get an alliance with Lithuania. And then you will have reasons on why they won't ally you, and you don't want to be dealing with that. So just do not rival Lithuania. Everyone else, you can go ahead and rival. As far as your starting alliances are concerned, the ones that you're aiming for are Saxony, Hess, Friesland, and then either Württemberg or Switzerland if you can pick them up. The reason why is because you actually have a mission down here called the German Mercenaries, which requires you to have people that have a mercenary company have a hundred opinion of you or be you or your subjects. And here's the thing, those tags, they have mercenary companies in their borders. So you're simply going to come in here, you're going to ally Saxony, you're then going to ally the next day, you're going to ally Hesse, Friesland, and then either Württemberg or Switzerland, depending on whoever's willing to, if they are. Once you have them down, you should have enough opinion to complete this mission. If not, just improve a little bit, and you'll get there soon enough. Once that's done, it's time to start improving relations with Poland, with Burgundy, and the people that you want to get as allies. Do not ally, however, the Teutons, Livonians, or Riga. You're going to be fighting these guys soon enough. Once that's done, though, it's simply time for me to wait until the 11th of December, because I'm going to be attacking Gotland as soon as I possibly can. And as you can see here, Lithuania is backing them up, but it really doesn't matter. So I'm going to be pausing the recording until I can get to that point, and I'm going to be improving relations with who I need to, to get them to 100 opinion with me, just so I can complete this mission. So I will see you guys in just a second. And welcome back everybody. So it's the 12th of December, so I can now declare on Gotland. And Lithuania did fall under the personal union, so they're not there. But I did want to point out why it really doesn't matter if anybody's allied to them. Because Lithuania in particular, they don't have a navy. So you just take your navy here and just stick them out into the sea, and eventually they'll peace out. But once that's done, you're going to take these guys over, and you're just going to invade Gotland. You already have a core there, so you can conquer it and not have to deal with any kind of separatism or anything like that. So don't worry about it, just declare and move in as quickly as you can. As I said though, Sweden does have an event that'll just give them 25 increased liberty desire. So turn on support loyalists as soon as you can, preferably before you unpause, I just forgot to. 
and that'll keep them from becoming disloyal. If they get any more disloyalty for whatever reason, don't be afraid to dev their provinces. They do have some grasslands here, because every time you dev click in their provinces, they lose five liberty desire. Just don't do it too much, because you're gonna be slowing yourself down. With that being done, it's time to move on. So I'm gonna go ahead and start improving relations with all the guys that I need to get these mercenaries done, and then finally Poland. But with that, I'll see you guys in a little bit. And welcome back everybody. So it's been a couple of months. The Germans like me enough to now finish this mission and allowing me to have the event pop up. As you can see, it gives me a bunch of mercenary companies in my own provinces I can now recruit. Reduces the maintenance cost until the end of the game, but the last ones are really important. Recruiting mercenaries will no longer cost any army professionalism as long as this exists, which is until the end of the game. So I now have the ability to hire mercenaries without having to worry about losing professionalism, which I can use to get extra manpower when I need to. Always a very good thing to have. So do this as soon as you can. Once that's done, again, get ready to break these alliances and replace them with people that are going to be far more useful to you, such as Poland, and just roll marry them as soon as you possibly can and replace these guys out as you go along. In this case, since I now no longer need them, I can dissolve this alliance and then break the Friesland one as soon as I can, because Republic. And don't take anybody's royal marriage unless you actually want to keep them. With that being said, I'll see you guys in a bit once I'm done with Gauntland and it's time to move on. See you in a second. And welcome back everybody. So it's only been a couple of months, but I wanted to show you this event because it's one of those demands of the nobility five-year pulses that you'll get as you play through the game. Yes, it starts that fast. And as you can see, they're not exactly good. I can either lose a bunch of loyalty with the nobility, which I don't care, but I will have to fight 14 rebel regiments, or I'll gain to corruption, but I at least get some loyalty. So you're going to have things like this pop up every five years just to frustrate your game. In this case, I don't necessarily care about the corruption. I can eat the corruption for now. I really don't care. But I don't want to be fighting rebels because I'm eventually going to be having to fight a lot more and I would rather have the manpower. With that being said, I'll see you guys in a little bit. And welcome back everybody. So as you can see, I did end up retaking Gotland, allowing me to complete this mission of retake Gotland. And I wanted to talk about this very briefly because you do have the option of releasing them as a pirate republic. Do not do so. There is really no advantage to doing this. Instead, just go ahead and banish him from Gotland. Now here's the thing. Obviously, you're getting one stability. If you want to save this mission to do ratify the Kalmar Union later, you absolutely can. There is no rush to doing this. I am just doing this now because I'm already down one stability and it really doesn't matter, but I want to have at least zero for unrest reasons. Now I did end up losing a galley in that fight, so I have to build one more to complete this mission to get the Livonian Order claim, so do keep an eye on that because this is pretty frustrating. With that being said, I'm just going to move my army over to get ready to invade the Livonian Order, and I'm going to move my troops up here to Viborg so I can quickly walk around to Narwa as quickly as I can for when I actually attack them. With that being done, though, I'm able to pretty much continue. I just need to actually pick up the alliances that I'm able to pick up now because I spent my time during that brief war making people like me a little bit more. So I will see you guys in a little bit when it's time to talk further. See you then. And welcome to a couple of years later. I now have the fleet necessary to actually complete this mission and I'll gain an admiral to boot. So I'm going to, of course, assign him. It really doesn't matter if he's any good. And I'm going to use the new claims that I got on the Livonian Order to attack the Livonian Order and pull in Riga and the Teutonic Order. Now the Teutonic Order may or may not have decent allies here. If they end up having just a bunch of allies, obviously don't co-belligerate them. In this instance, they only have Mecklenburg. So I'm going to co-belligerate them just because less aggressive expansion, and why not? Riga, they will usually have the Trade League, and it's just not worth it. So I'm not going to be co-belligerating Riga. I'm going to set Narwa as my war goal and declare. You don't need any allies for this. Sweden and Norway alone should be able to handle this. Simply sink their navies where you can and make sure you hold this naval area here because they won't be able to make it to anywhere up here in Scandinavia without fighting through you. Other than that, just fight it like you normally would. It really is not that hard of a war. It just takes time and it can cost you a lot of manpower, which is why you complete this German mercenaries mission first, because that way you can replace them 
with all your other mercenary companies without any real downside. With all of that being said, I'm going to see you guys in a little bit because I actually need to fight this, and I will explain one of the reasons why you want to get Poland so bad once I am done. See you guys in a second. And welcome back everybody. So as you can see, this war is over, but the map has already changed, and I want to talk about what has changed. Basically all you're aiming for if you cannot co-belligerate the Teutonic Order is Danzig and Konigsberg. That's it. If you can pick up Memel as well, go for it. If you can co-belligerate them, occupy as much as you can, because Poland will attack the Teutonic Order at roughly the same time you do, and they want all of the land, and I mean every single province here. So if you let them get the occupation, they're taking it, but if you can grab it first, you can annex it yourself. As far as Riga and the Livonian Order, you're full annexing both of them. So let me go, let's go ahead and piece these guys out real quick, so I can show you what the game plan is after this. So I'm full annexing the Teutonic Order, taking all of their money, and one of the big reasons why you want to ally with the Polish at this time is because by doing so, you should be able to barely maintain it, and it prevents them from joining a coalition, which is huge right now. But let's go ahead and piece these all out, and then we can move on to the next subject of what we really need to talk about. And yes, as you can see, a coalition will form. They almost always will form. Usually only if you take Danzig and Konigsberg only will you not have a larger coalition that can actually form. But now it is time to immediately turn around and re-release the Teutonic Order back into the world because I want to eventually get these other cores. Is it important right now? No, but they're never going to expire, which is exactly what I'm aiming for. And again, I want to keep Poland on side, so as soon as I get my guy back, I need to improve relations with Poland to get them to not break the alliance. And if that means I need to send them money, then I need to send them money. If whatever it takes, I need to keep them on side. For now, however, it's simply coring these up and getting these provinces moving. Beforehand, however, you're going to take all of these provinces that you can, and you're going to concentrate development into Zeeland. And then you're going to go to Schleswig-Holstein and do the same thing there. Because by doing this, you should get close to 30, allowing you to dev up a little bit more to get to 30, because you want to get this Splendor bonus as soon as you possibly can. This is why you're doing this as quickly as you are, because the sooner you can get both of these two Splendor objectives done, the quicker you'll be able to get Danish Subject Loyalty, and then once you get Embrace Renaissance, which having 30 development in your province will help speed up, it will allow you to then get this privilege as quickly as you can and suddenly have everybody be loyal. So I'm going to go ahead and work on coring all this up and just do some basic maintenance for a couple of months. I'll bring you guys back to talk about the next things we need to talk about. So see you guys in just a second. And welcome back, everybody. So it's been a couple of years, and I wanted to bring you guys back to give you a quick update. I am integrating Holstein now because I do have a second subject allowing me to have strong duchies. And then once Holstein is gone, as long as I maintain one normal vassal, I get to maintain this privilege, giving me less liberty desire in Sweden, which I absolutely need. I was able to salvage my alliance with Poland, which is going to be very useful, not just because I'll be able to use favors to get these provinces back, but far more usefully, I'll be able to use them against Muscovy without any real issue. I was also able to pick up Burgundy and Austria as allies, and if you wait to complete the mission down here, the European stage, it'll give you 25 increased trust with all of these larger allies, meaning they're going to maintain it over other alliances because you have a lot of trust. Very, very useful thing to wait for. But... The last thing I want to talk about is I am attacking Novgorod. Now, there are three options you have available when it comes to Novgorod. First, you can attack them whenever you want, conquer the land. The second one is you conquer the land, but you re-release the new subjects that they have here, not Sapmi, but you release Karelian, or Karelia, and you feed them the other provinces here. And the reason why is because that way you don't have to spend the admin coring it, but more importantly, you can use it to re-release Novgorod. The last option is to allow Muscovy to attack Novgorod twice and vassalize what's left. The reason why is because for whatever reason at the beginning of the game, Novgorod is worth less than 200 war score, but Muscovy almost never takes massive chunks out of them. They almost always will leave it so there's only a handful of provinces of Novgorod after two wars. I don't know why it does it, but it does it. 
meaning if you wait until after the Second War, you might be able to diplomatically vassalize Novgorod and use them to reconquer cores where they're not going to be mad at you. The other option is, is simply to conquer them and then release them as a vassal and then use that to reconquer Muscovy. In this instance, I'm attacking them and I'm probably going with the second option, which will allow me to have both Karelia and Novgorod. So I'm going to go ahead and move forward with that. And I'll bring you guys back at the end to explain to you what I'm talking about with having both of them while also feeding Karelia all the provinces. So I'll see you guys in a little bit. And here's the CD key for this video. If you want to redeem a copy of this game, just be the first person to redeem this CD key into Steam, and you'll be the one to get it. All I ask is that you please comment on this video that you're the one that got the game. With that being said, let's jump back to the video. And welcome back everybody. So as you can see, Corelli is now on the map, and I did give them provinces that are not even their own culture or their cores, because I want to be able to release Novgorod later without having to annex Karelia or release Novgorod with all of their cores here to have to repay for again, which you'd have to do if you full annex them right now. Here's the thing. You're able to re-release Novgorod even if Karelia is on the map because you can just go in here and seize one of the provinces that has Novgorodian culture and Novgorodian cores, allowing you to re-release Novgorod even if Karelia is still on the map. So I'm able to wait to see if Novgorod gets eaten by Muscovy, which since they're under 100 war score is very likely by their next war, and then also have a Novgorod vassal that I can use to reconquer all of their land as well. So I'm able to use those cores against Muscovy to then deny them Novgorod itself. And by denying them Novgorod itself, I'm preventing Muscovy from forming Russia and becoming an actual threat. And that's all you have to do with Muscovy. If you want to keep fighting Muscovy after that, you can, especially with Poland, but this will permanently remove Muscovy as any real threat to your border for the next 150 years, and that's if you ignore them and let them build up to become a threat. With that being said, let's now turn to other things. Namely, I now have the ability to take this Splendor Bonus, and this allows me to talk about these two missions because now I have the loyalty reduction that I wanted in place before I click those buttons. So let's talk about them. For full disclosure, I did have to Alt F4 the game and reload it because I had a coughing fit after I had clicked a bunch of buttons. So let's go ahead and try this again. Now, when you click both the Crown of Norway and the Crown of Sweden, you'll have these two events pop up. And you have three options on how you handle them. Either you economically harm yourself to make them more loyal, you get some free admin or diplomatic power depending on the country, or you make them more disloyal, but you get massive economic boosts. Obviously, it's going to depend in large part on how loyal they happen to be. But because now that I have this Splendor bonus, I'm able to make them disloyal and not care. So if you want to do this early, absolutely do it. Click the buttons whenever you can. But be aware, if you go with the boost your economy early, they're going to be a lot more disloyal. As you can see with Sweden, there's a 50% shift. With Norway, it's even worse because you're losing the 50% reduction from them being historical friends, and you're adding even more from being historical rivals. It's a 100% shift. So if you're going to have a problem with that, don't click making them that way. You can still use the support loyalists or paying off debt or whatever else you need to do to keep them loyal after that point, but at this point, they're fine. They're not going to be rebellious. And on top of that, once you hit the events for the nobles of Sweden, Sweden's going to lose all their liberty desire anyway. They lose 100 liberty desire from the events of the nobles of Sweden. And that's going to trigger probably in the next 10 years. So I need to get ready for that. This one I can now click because I did annex uh, Holstein, but I did not have the crown of Norway clicked. So just wait on that one if you want to. But now it's just waiting for all the Swedish rebels to start popping up. And again, that's about 10 years. So I'm going to be waiting for that, watching Novgorod, seeing if anybody else becomes a problem. And now that my economy should be on the right track, I just have to wait until these guys are done being reinforced. I should be able to start building up my lightships and my marketplaces to actually being able to contest the Lubeck trade node against Lubeck and start having those missions be done. So I will see you guys in a little bit. And welcome back everybody. So I wanted to talk about what just happened in the game because it's something that's only happened once or twice in my 30 test runs as Denmark. 
and it's something that can be very useful to you if it actually fires. And it's something that makes Burgundy a good ally, even in this kind of circumstance where they're probably going to get inherited and not by you. So what is it? It's the Feast of the Pheasant, which gives you a Holy War CV on the Ottomans because you like Burgundy. Here's the thing, you already have really strong allies, and usually they don't like the Ottomans and they will outnumber the Ottomans, allowing you to run in using a CB to release people out of the Ottomans, such as Byzantium, and really just wreck the Ottomans' day. Very, very effectively. And if you want to do this, absolutely go for it. I'm not going to do that this game for the simple reason that well, you're not likely to have the money that you're going to get out of the Ottomans, let alone have the Ottomans be defanged in your game, unless you're lucky and this happens again. It's happened twice out of 30 runs. So it doesn't always happen. So if you have it and you want to take advantage of it, absolutely do it. It's really fun to remove the Ottomans from the board, because once they lose a major war like that and lose the Byzantines, it's largely over for them. With that being said, though, I will see you guys a little bit, because I need to keep playing for a little bit longer to talk about the next thing. See you then. And welcome back, everybody. So in the current game that I'm in, I'm not able to continue through with the Nobles of the Swedes mission, because this requires a event to fire in Sweden, which only has a mean time to happen of 60 months and since 1450, but just hasn't yet, it seems. And the reason why is 10 years after that event fires, you will get the Constitution of Scandinavia event, and ten years after that, you will then have another event that basically fires, giving Sweden about six different stacks of Pretender Rebels, and I haven't gotten those events yet, so I'm still just waiting for that to finally fire. In the meantime, though, Muscovy did end up taking out Novgorod, so I seized the province from Karelia, released Novgorod as a vassal, and now I'm going to go ahead and attack Muscovy to get these cores back, because there's a lot of them, and it'll cripple Muscovy for the rest of the game. So I'm going to go ahead and do this because they really don't stand a chance. It's 2-1 to one at this point. And I'll see you guys in a little bit once I'm done dealing with Muscovy. See you guys then. And speak of the devil, just a couple of months into the war, I have the Scandinavian Constitution. So I now have 10 years before I'm going to have to fight all the pretender rebels in Sweden. So, I'm getting a stability, a bunch of monarch power, and Sweden likes me just a little bit less. Not enough to matter, but just a little bit less. So I'm going to go ahead and continue to fight Muscovy, because I got time. And I'll see you guys in a little bit. And welcome back, everybody. So as you can see, Muscovy absolutely lost that war. All of Novgorod's cores are back in their hands. And on top of that, Muscovy even lost an extra thousand ducats. I used that to build a marketplace in every single one of the centers of trade, upgrade them all to level 2 at the very minimum, and then on top of that, I turned on the local trade power edicts in every one of these states. This makes it so you can fairly easily get to 30%, though you will still need quite a lot of trade ships anyway. It's still very useful to have them just because. Now, the reason why you also want to turn on those edicts is because once you look at the amount of money that you make out of trade doing so, it definitely makes it pay off in the long run because this will what keep your economy floating, especially when you have all the goods produced coming in, for making Sweden more disloyal using the Crown of Sweden mission right here. And I'm now at 30%, so I'm able to complete this mission. All this does is it allows me to embargo people in the HRE, and then click a decision that makes them attack me in a trade conflict. And the ones that you're targeting are anybody that owns the Strasland province, the Stettin province, the Lübeck province, the Bremen province, and the Hamburg province. All of those countries will pretty much attack you, and you want them to. The reason why is because it's a defender, for less aggressive expansion, you can take whatever you want. Meaning you can vassalize or conquer these provinces in the HRE, and they'll become yours, making it so it's very, very easily, because these are the centers of trade, to control all of the money coming into the Lubeck node. Very, very useful thing to have. Here's the thing. It's a war where every one of your allies is called in too. Which means Austria, since they set a lot of land up here as interesting land, as does Poland, if you call them in, they may take the occupation 
of the capitals or the provinces themselves. So if you're going to do this, be sure you're ready to land or attack quickly and get into the HRE provinces so you're the one with occupation. That's really it. Once you have that done, just make sure you have no aggressive expansion in the HRE, or very, very little. If you want to, make sure you have the aggressive expansion reduction in the Age of Discovery. And if you're going that route, pick up espionage ideas for the extra 20% reduction there. Because if you do that, you should be able to pick up Bremen and Hamburg and Lübeck and vassalize these two and still not have a coalition that you really need to be worried about. And since you should have Austria as a ally, you won't get any unlawful demands for territory. So, you should be good there. I'm still waiting on those rebels to start firing though, so I'm going to be pausing the recording again one last time so that I can show you what it is and what you should be picking. So I'll see you guys in just a second. And welcome back everybody. So it's been 10 years since the Constitution of Scandinavia event fired, which means it's time to deal with the aftermath of that event which is the Brewing Revolution of Sweden. There's two ways that you can handle this. Either you fight five separate stacks of rebels, four of which are pretender, one of which is noble, which is a good thing because they actually can fight each other, or, in the alternative, you gain a stability, but they also have an event. And what does this event do? It's pretty simple. It makes them lose 100 liberty desire, but it also makes them lose 100 opinion. So they'll be absolutely loyal and won't rebel, but they're absolutely going to break free once your ruler dies. And there's almost nothing you can do to stop that. I have tried multiple times. Do not do the second option. It is absolutely not worth it. Go ahead and do the first one. Here's the thing to keep in mind. The ability of the rebels to fight is going to be based on the military tech of Sweden. So if you have the ability to have tech level 7 with them level 6 or whatever it happens to be, try and do it as much as you can. Because if you have a morale advantage over their rebels from tech, you'll be able to wipe them out much, 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 much easier. In this case, I can't, but it's not exactly a big deal because I outnumber them massively. Also on top of that, if you went with the German mercenaries down below and you took care of that early on, you'll be able to hire them without losing anything. And realistically, just keep them from occupying Stockholm and you should be fine. With that being said, time to unpause, simply fight this out and try and use Sweden to win these fights easier because they will move in and help fight these rebels as long as they have morale and they're actually next to the province. So try and use them to your advantage and just stack wipe when you can. With that being said, I'm just gonna walk around and take these guys out because there's only a couple more things to talk about, but I need to pause it so I'll see you guys in just a second. And welcome back everybody. So after you've decided to fight the five stacks of rebels, this event will then fire the Pretender War of Sweden, and basically it adds three more to the mix, but also makes Sweden lose all of their liberty desire and adds them as a historical friend, meaning you're not going to have any problems keeping them contained. But you do have more people that you have to fight. It will also allow you to complete this mission, allowing you to get plus two to the military monarch power growth of your ruler, so if you have a guy that's about to die, try and hold on to it until he does, so you can have this for longer. And then once you have all of these guys contained, all of these pretender rebels dealt with, and three stability, and 100 legitimacy, then you're going to be able to do this mission and finally end those noble events becoming a problem and have a much better government reform. So I'm going to go ahead and wipe these guys out, get to that point, show you the government reform, and then show you the final steps. Because after that point, there's anything that you can choose to do. So I'll see you guys in just a second. And welcome back everybody. So all 200,000 worth of troops that Sweden had in their pretender rebels have been dealt with, meaning I can now continue with the guide. Before I do so though, I do want to point out what you're trying to do fighting them, because what you're trying to do is prevent the pretender rebels from breaking Sweden. To break Sweden, they have to occupy a fortified province. So either Elfsborg, Kalmar, Stockholm, or Viborg. So if you're just over here in Sweden proper, and they take Viborg, considering the fact they have eight different stacks running around, they're usually able to get the 50% of development occupied insanely quickly. Meaning if you don't focus and protect Viborg too, it's likely to fall, and then once that happens, it's like the end of the month, they're independent. 
So use your ships, move between these areas, keep them off the forts. Every time a pretender rebel steps onto any of the forts, land nearby, attack them, because then you'll be the defender, and then move in to wherever they retreat to and stack wipe them. Just get them off the board. As long as you keep them from getting a fortified province, they really shouldn't be able to break Sweden, so you can take your time. Or you can do what I did and use mercenaries and went into a little bit of debt just to end it faster. With that being said, we can now focus on our final target, for this guide at least, of England. So let's go ahead and talk about them. When it comes to invading the British Isles, whether you're attacking the English, the Scottish, or even the British if they happen to form, the tactic remains the same. Take your entire army, land them in Okinyar, and then invade them over the strait. Simple enough. The thing is, is that England and Scotland both have a nasty habit of getting strong allies. England is Castile, and Scotland will usually be allied to, or guaranteed by, France, who will then have to fight as well. So how do you deal not with England and Scotland, but with France and Castile? Well, both of them will try and invade Jutland here, but then they won't be able to cross over into Orison so long as your navy is strong enough to hold them at bay. France really doesn't send their navy to do anything to you, so they're not really a problem. Castile, however, might. And Castile has enough galleys to actually be a threat. If the Castilians and the English send their full navies, usually they'll end up occupying this sea tile here just to bottle you in, because this is not an inland sea. But every so often, Castile does feel strong enough to attack you. If they do and they move down, they might actually win that. So if England is allied to Castile, make certain you have enough galleys to hold this sea tile no matter what. Because if you don't, it is very, very, very bad news for you. But with that being said, England really isn't that difficult to crack because once you beat them in the first war and break this alliance, the next one is incredibly easy. And then the one after that and the one after that. Just whittle them down, break them apart, and then annex what's remaining. The rest of your expansion paths are pretty obvious. You can obviously take on the British Isles, but you can also continue pushing through Muscovy and then into Asia. You can go and betray Poland and use your quality level as well as your numbers to rip them apart. And Lithuania, just like a lot of other tags, is filled with other tags, allowing you to get one province and then use that to reconquer a bunch of others and integrate and more and integrate and more and integrate. The same is true with France, where after you're done with England, it might then be time to go after France and start picking them apart as well. And then you have the Northern Germans, or if you want to, you can even become the leader of the HRE, the Emperor. It's entirely up to you how you want to play. The only thing I will say, however, is if you are going to go colonial, do not pick colonial ideas early. Go with other options first. The reason why is in your colonial missions here, you get colonists and the ability to recruit explorers and conquistadors for 50 years for free. On top of that, down here, you'll get another colonist for free. This one for 75 years, but you lose them if you get a colonist from any idea. Meaning you'll have two for free unless you go exploration or expansion. So just hold off on those because it's just not worth it. But going colonial absolutely is because usually... Within another 100 years, I've occupied all the British Isles, all of France, or all of Muscovy, and all of Poland-Lithuania, again, within 100 years, without even coalitions firing, making it stupidly easy to become massively overpowered, outscaling even the Ottomans in 90% of my games. Denmark is stupidly overpowered in this current patch. So if you want to go for one of those Conquering the World games, or anything else for that matter, try it as Denmark. If you're new to this game, again, try it as Denmark. You'll have a lot of fun doing it. With all of that being said though, if you like this kind of content, like and subscribe, I will absolutely be making more nation guides. If you want to see a particular nation, leave it in the comment below. I will leave in a comment all the nations I've already had recorded so you don't have to request something that's already been done, but let me know what you guys want to see, because if I haven't recorded it yet, it's kind of random on what I choose to record, unless somebody specifically requests something, because I try and do that before I pick something random. So let me know what you guys want to see. Other than that, thank you all for watching. I hope you all have a wonderful day.